Hello, good morning. Uh, it's first. Uh, what is it? No, actually, it's this. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's the second Sunday of uh, September. So I guess the good thing about now is the heat will start to go away. <laughs> but you know, the cold will come. In other words, you know, we find or we always find something to complain about. But um. Today is good be to to be um around fellow believers. Our strength and our hope comes from Christ, not necessarily from uh you know the things that we have accomplished. It does make us feel better, but unfortunately, when we all you know when we all leave this place, we can take none of it with us. So um I know I guess I'm I'm learning um I'm learning money is a way to uh I can live a comfortable life but it doesn't necessarily mean that oh cuz I you know attain a lot of money I'm going to be happy all the time you know I'll buy you know I'll go buy a big car and just drive all over the place that's what I used to think I used to think man you know I'm going to go get me a Mustang and I started looking at those gas prices. I uh, no, I'm not. The same thing with the uh, you know with, with, with a lot of the Dodges. Um, and my life is uh my I I realize my what is it they call it? I'm a work in progress. Of uh you know how I view this world. Uh, and then another thing is don't don't take people so personal. You know, everybody has their hangups every now and then. So um, let them be who. Who they are at that moment. Um, and I, I like it how it says, uh, don't worry in the Bible. What does it Matthew 6, 33? Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And it says that, uh, don't worry about tomorrow because it has today have enough problems of its own. I'm like, wow, man. Um, yeah. I, can't, I just keep praying that uh, every day I'll become more and more God-filled. I realize uh, what, what, when I'm uh, excuse me, on that plane, it's less uh, about the way that I feel, and I don't know. I don't. I don't feel too out of it a lot of times. So with that, what I'm gonna say is, um, thanks. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Thanks uh, to listen to my prayer, and I hope that. Uh, you will uh, get something from the word today. And, um, oh yeah, I, I'm going to say this. Uh, these videos are for educational purposes okay, hold only. On, buddy. Okay, okay. Hold on. Very good. Okay. Thank you. I was going to remind you. Now I'm going to move it to the screen here. All right. Hey, if you, if you like uh, his uh, goatee sporting man, leave a message in the comment or comment comments or whatever I'm trying to tell them to grow that thing don't worry about the few little gray hairs go ahead buddy read it go to it. so you want me to read it again yeah yeah you know okay give us our legal disclaimer oh okay the legal disclaimer of uh, okay these videos are for educational purposes only and if you have any questions please address the questions to um, www.youtube.com backslash at John Robinson 6421. Pretty good. Pretty awesome. Stay there for a moment, sir. Okay, okay. See, uh, Miss, it said Miss Ruth Hansen is watching. Oh. And uh, tell Ruth we sent her, resent her the study notes. I'll tell her. Okay. Well, Ru well, Ruth. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, we've sent you the study notes. Okay. We sent. Okay. We sent. Yeah. All right, buddy. Good job. Yeah. I like it. It looks good on film. You look like that guy that the Avenger on the, the Marvel mystery, the guy that had the wings. Uh -huh. The cool guy. Yeah. I see, uh, Captain America. Yeah, Captain America. Yes. 
Yeah, a new cap. They, uh, they're making a new cap. Yeah. Yeah. A new one? Yeah. But it doesn't come out until like February next year. Okay. All right. So. We're putting everybody, uh, most of us, um, most of us have, uh, what, what can I say? Walk like highs and lows, right? Des, can you turn that light on over there? So, and that way, Herman, Herman, you need that light on? I, I noticed this. Can it see? Is it a messing the TV? <laughs> okay, I was gonna say if you on or off or on, do you guys want the overhead light on? Don't matter, Don't matter to you. All right. So at any rate, where I was going, all of us seem as we're walking in Christ, we have these ups and downs, right? And uh, somebody just uh, shared briefly. I wish you'd share a lot, but. Um, that she's been blessed and as a job uh, client where she's been making like twice as much money. Yeah, so praise God. Praise God. It's good. It's good to be have sufficiency, right? We're not preaching a, a, a prosperity doctrine. We're preaching an abundance. A more than enough. It's always better to have money left over at the end of the month than to have exactly what you need, right? Uh, what's the problem with having all your needs met? You can't meet anybody else's, right? You need all your needs met plus, right? So you it's more blessed to give than to receive. Well, it's hard to give if you don't have anything to give, right? So um, let's keep it in balance. God does want us to have be sufficient to do all his will, which includes having more than you need, not just what you need. Uh, yes. Can I add to I used to always pray that God would meet all my needs, and he did exactly every need I had, but I never had anything left over. And one day I said, you know, I this is crazy. Because friends would invite me to lunch and or things, or I I saw a need and I couldn't do anything about it. Finally, I started thanking God for meeting all my needs and for blessing me with the little extra that that I could do stuff with. Not that I wanted to be extravagant or just do things with people. Can I share that here yes. because? Facebook, they hear you, but YouTube, I have to kind of speak in. So if I say it wrong, correct me. I'm just going to paraphrase. My sister says she used to pray to God that he'd meet her needs. And he did all the time. Until she realized that she wanted more in her needs so that she could go out to dinner or lunch or go do things with her friends, be able to have extra money to spend things that, normally shouldn't do am i paraphrasing it yeah, well enough or give, to somebody. or give to somebody amen praise god okay so we're in the book of revelations guys and we're getting close to the end there's 21 chapters so our, our 22 whoa, chapters 20 21 verses in chapter 22 so we're uh got a couple more sessions before we're out of uh, 19. But 19 uh, obviously comes after 18. And as a remembrance, uh, what happened in 18 was the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? The marriage, the wedding, the supper, how we taught about that. So this is afterwards, but it's kind of about what happened in the in turn. So it's a quarter after, let's call it, you know, and need to get going. So Revelation 19, reading verses 11 through 18. 
This is what the word says. And I saw heaven open and behold a white horse. I, this is John, the apostle Paul. A white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. So Jesus is sitting on this uh, uh, horse and he makes war. How many of us remember think that Jesus um, Christians should be against war? You know, Christians should Christians should uh, what do we call it? Conscientious objectors. They don't want to kill anybody, right? We shouldn't make war. But Jesus is a man of war, and Jesus is going to annihilate, kill, and destroy a lot of people. However, we got to put that time period thing. This is after the wedding of the Lamb. This is after Christians have been um, uh, resurrected. This is after that age of grace, where God did not come to destroy the world or condemn the world, but deliver those that given people a chance who believe in them to obtain eternal life. This is a different time period. Now Jesus is coming back to do business. Okay. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he should rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourself together unto the supper of the great God that ye may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sat on them and the flesh of men, both free and bond, both small and great. Amen. Lord, bless your word. Let it go forth and not come back void that all who hear this will understand what you're telling us. And bless John continually for writing, being obedient, and writing this, these scriptures down that we could all hear and obey. So, once the marriage and its supper had taken place, there is an undetermined amount of time before Christ and his bride goes to battle against the inhabitants of earth. Although this period might be the next day, it is most likely, or it most likely is not, as God gave us instructions as to when newlyweds could enter any type of battle. Remember, God has given us scriptures to be a type and shadow of things to come, and he told us a newlyweds was not to engage in warfare for at least one year after his marriage. Now, we talked about the wedding feast and the, the wedding and the marriage and how that was typically a seven day period. And during the wedding, you had witnesses that would witness that the bride and the groom went into the what the bridal chamber, which was typically a, a tent made up and they would consummate their marriage okay and then afterwards they would have the 
uh, marriage, the, the, I mean, the marriage supper, the, the feast, the supper of the wedding, were those who seen and witnessed this, that they would be there supporting forever their marriage and forbidding forever a divorce of their marriage. That was the whole concept of it. We kind of have it in our weddings the same, but we put the copulation, the the newly the, the honeymoon after the feast. You know, what do we call it when you have a wedding and you go eat the food? Reception. The reception. We have the reception first, then they go away on their honeymoon to do their honeymoon things. Well, the Jewish custom, it was different. But there was more things to that. Deuteronomy 24, verse 5 says, And when a man hath taken a new wife, he shall not go to war, neither shall he be charged with any business, nor shall he be charged with any business. But he shall be free at home one year, and shall cheer up his wife, which he has taken. What a society that you could get married and not have to go to war or do any business. Now, this isn't business like buying, selling, trade, going out in the field and 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 plowing the fields and stuff. This is business like being in leadership, sitting on the gates, being on the council, the city council, doing anything that would take your time away from your family. But it, you, surely you had to go take care of your animals. Surely had you go if you had cows, go milk the cows, right? Clean up the the clean their mess up, right? Et cetera, et cetera. The word of God is clear that after you got married, you don't go to war for a year. So if that's a type and shadow, maybe this undetermined amount of time was about a year in heaven that we spend with God, not going to war, just being made happy. You know, every tear wiped away, every sorrow for God. Maybe that time is when we get to ask all these questions. God, why'd you do this? Why'd you do that? How explain this? And that we just get to know God so much that we're now equipped and able to go to a battle with him. Because remember, we went to battle with Jesus during this battle that has already taken place, okay? So, kind of an interesting concept. The Bible doesn't say in Revelations that there was a year period, but the Bible does say Scripture is a type and shadow. So, Jesus commanded Moses to give this law. It's probably he's going to keep it in heaven too. Okay, therefore, it is highly suspected that Jesus is most likely going to spend time with his bride before he goes in the bottle. Amen. How I mean, that's I, I look at that as that's cool, man, because here we are. We're going to get raptured. We're going to get married. And then we got to turn around and go right back to battle, right back to earth. We just get raptured. We're turning around. But now we've got to go right back down and fight. That's kind of suck. Let's have some time together. Well, I believe we do. I think we're going to have a great time with Lord Jesus. Now, verse 11 says, uh, let me just open this so we remind, because I read it was pretty lengthy. But verse 11 says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. Amen. In righteousness, he does that. Okay. Verse 11 says, Jesus is faithful and true, and in righteousness, he judges and makes wars. This means Jesus starts and finishes this war against those who shed blood, or shed the blood of the saints, which make up his bride. He's not warring against anybody just because. He's warring against those that would oppose his bride. 
He made war earlier before the new covenant. He made war against Sodom, the city of Sodom, and the city of Gomorrah, and the five, which are part of the five cities of the plains. And he destroyed them all. Little babies, pregnant women, old people. He destroyed them all because they were coming against his bride. They were coming against Lot and Lot's family, from which Jesus is born. But let's look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, doth thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? See, those people that crucified Paul, cru or uh, killed Paul, uh, crucified Peter upside down, crucified Jesus, though all the martyrs, Jesus is going to take vengeance against them. Well, how about the Apostle Paul? Did he not persecute Christians? It was his name not Saul before? And did he not go about all the known world? finding people that were opposed to Judaism, thinking he was doing God's will. But Paul says he did it in ignorance. And because he did it in ignorance, he got forgiveness of God. Versus the word of God says there's no provision for anything, any willful sin. Anything done deliberately, there's no offering of forgiveness. That's a pretty amazing thing. Now, do you know this has nothing to do with your salvation? Because even though God forgave Paul of killing people, rounding them up to be killed because he did it in ignorance, he was that man was still killed. The wages of sin is death. But Paul himself says that he has been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer he that liveth, but Christ that liveth in him. By the faith of Christ. See, Paul is saying he's a new creation. The old man's dead. But he's, the old man had forgiveness. He had forgiveness. That spirit had forgiveness. So God could take of that spirit, put his DNA in that spirit, and raise it from the dead, and allow it to live in this old vessel of, of filth. See, the Bible tells us that God could take a vessel created for dishonor and turn it into a vessel of honor. Now, you know, in the, in, in the olden times, in time of Jesus and when Paul wrote this, they didn't have bathrooms to say. What did they have? Vessels. We call them commodes, right? Well, one's for water, right? One's for wine, right? But one's for what? Your bedchamber, your commode, right? Now, once you would have that, you would never, ever, ever use that vessel for any other purpose because you couldn't get all the bacteria out. You, if it had a problem, you had to destroy it and break it, and you could throw it in the potter's field, okay? And people didn't go into potter's field, step four, if they had to, because what happens if you step on a piece of pottery that has... E. coli in it. You get hurt. So this is the whole Potter's Field thing with Judas of Iscariot, etc., etc. But what we got to tell you is God says he can make that old vessel, which you were, a clean vessel by forgiving you. That forgiveness doesn't enter you into the kingdom of heaven because even though you're forgiven, you must be born again. You must become a new creation. You must have the DNA of Jesus Christ in you. You see the difference? We don't go to heaven because our sins are forgiven. We live in this body because our sins are forgiven. I live in this temple because this temple, this temple right here, right now, is holy and righteous in the name of Jesus, in the sight of Jesus. It might have been despicable. It might have been full of evil. It might have been a bedchamber pot. But God changed me. He forgave me of all my sins. 
You notice the difference? Very subtle, but it answers so many questions. Okay, now as scripture is de uh, defined scripture, the word used for true is also used in John 1, 9 to describe Jesus as the true light who lighteth every man's steps that were written in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. Okay, so this word true, what do you think true means? Anybody? Strong's G228. Okay, true means true, right? It means right, uh, the opposite of fictitious, okay? That which not only the name and resemblance, but the real nature corresponding to the name in every respect corresponding to the idea signified by the name, real, true, genuine. Okay, so... People back then were given names and their character somehow exhibited the name that was going to be given. Uh, sometimes it didn't and God changed their name from Abram to Abraham, from Sarai to Sarah, from Jacob to Israel, right? Okay, it's the opposite of fictitious, okay? It's um, the opposite of what is perfect. Defect, failed, uncertain, true. So it's the truth, right? But Jesus says he is the truth and the light. So John chapter 1, verse 9. Says, says, this is what the Apostle John says. Who's the same guy who's writing the Revelation, right? But the author is the Holy Spirit. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. So he's saying Jesus is the light. He's saying, and he was not the light. This is John the Baptist saying he was not the light, but he sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light. So John the Baptist wasn't the true light, but John the Baptist was light, but he wasn't the true light okay he didn't have the name jesus he didn't have the name yeshua okay he we didn't have the name yahweh all right he is the true light uh you should check and refer to my names of uh the names of the of jesus of yahweh yehovah jehovah uh how it, that is the name of christ Jehovah, Yahweh, is the name of Christ, okay? Other people say Yeshua. Well, Yeshua is the name of the, uh, of the man, but not the name of the deity, uh, okay? Now, ask, um, okay, so he, Jesus is the light to who? He's the light to those whose names are written into Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. He's not the light to the children of the devil. As a matter of fact, Jesus spoke in parables so that the Pharisees that he was talking to, that group of Pharisees, not all Pharisees, so that the Pharisees would not only not understand what they hear, but they wouldn't believe what they heard. Your phone, you didn't put it on do not disturb. Okay, you're going to have to make sure you're back up on Facebook or just let it go to ignore. Maybe. Sorry about that, everyone. Probably best not to touch it. See if it goes back. Okay, Revelation chapter 17, verse 8. The beast that was saw... The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottom of his pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So all Christians, all the bride of Christ, all people whose names written in the Lamb's Book of Life are not are not on earth. There's no Christians left on earth. 
So many people say that the rapture, there's going to be the, those left behind, and during the tribulation, they can make a decision to follow God. Scripture contradicts that over and over again, and this is one place. The only people on earth are those whose names were not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, what if your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life, but you decided not to follow Jesus? That's right. She said he'll blot it out. So once it's blotted out, is your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life? No. We just got to be clear of this. The rapture is absolutely 100% true. And without, uh, the only way a person could say the rapture doesn't exist, they don't believe it, which people I love and cherish and know they love God, don't believe it is because they don't meditate on God's word. Why do you think God says meditate on his word? Why do you think I make these study notes for you? Because I don't want you to hear and believe what I say. I want you to hear and believe what the word of God says. Verse 12 and verse 13 tell us. Any comments more? Well, verse 12 and 13 says, His eyes were as flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. So who's the Word of God? Jesus. So this is Jesus, and he's wearing a vesture. What's a vesture? A vesture is a robe, and dip. That word dip, just not like we dip in tie-dye and, and dye clothing. You know, take a white t-shirt and dot, put it in black dye, you submerge it, you dip it, and it comes out. Baptism, you dip a uh, 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 cucumber into the uh, vinegar or something. It's called baptism. You dip it, you submerge it. It's actually sprinkling. What happens when you go, we've all seen some of these gross movies the, of blood, carnage, and stuff. What, what happens with the blood that makes it look all gross? It gets splattered all over somebody else, right? They're just covered in blood, and none of it might be theirs. It could be all from the person they're fighting, right? Well, Jesus' uh, robe is covered, splattered, with the blood of those he it he is fighting. This is not his blood. He's not wearing a blood a, a robe that was dipped in his blood. Where's all Jesus' blood? On the cross, covering all everyone on the face of the earth. Remember when Jesus was resurrected? Jesus walks on the shore and he sees the his uh, apostles, okay, which at that point were still disciples. And they come and they see him and, and they don't believe that it's him. They think they're seeing a spirit, a ghost. And he says, do spirits have flesh and bone as you see I? You know, are, are, do spirits have are flesh and blood? But he's flesh and bone. Jesus didn't have any blood left. He shed all his blood. His blood's not in heaven in a vast that he's keep sprinkling it. He's still not on the cross like the Catholic Church teaches, shedding his blood, sprinkling his blood. He shed it all. Why did Jesus shed it all? So no one could say, well, there's not enough for me. I was so bad. I did so many terrible things that there's just not enough uh, blood to go around. Jesus kept some. No, Jesus shed it all. Now, Jesus having fought and won many battles for the deliverance of his people has gained the reputation of a man of war. Jesus already, in the Old Testament, has the name a man of war. We look in Exodus 15, verse 3, And the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. That, lo, that word L-O-R-D is Jehovah, Yeshua, Y-H-W-H. 
That's his name. Man of war. Psalms 24, verse 8. Who is the king of glory? The Lord, Jehovah, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. See, Jesus, you don't become mighty in battle unless you've been through battles and won. Correct? Is there a bride there with him? No, this is the old covenant. After his latest battle, the one in, in the Revelation that we're reading about, Jesus' eyes seemed like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, which may have been those of the kings of the earth. This implies that he set his eyes on the task of avenging the blood of all saints by battling against the great whore and those who followed her. Additionally, in verse 16, we are told John sees Jesus wearing a banner on his robe and thigh, proclaiming he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords, meaning he is the Word of God, which no man or demon can stand against. However, this name the word of God, has not been made known to his enemies, and therefore they fight against him to their own demise. Make no mistake, Jesus is the word of God and has made himself known to his bride only. Now remember in Matthew chapter, uh, I think 721, somewhere around there, in the great day of the Lord, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, done many wonders in your name, performed signs and wonders, miracles, I'm paraphrasing. And Jesus says, get away from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. See, demons don't know the word of God. They've heard G Jesus being referred to as the word of God. The people that Jesus is fighting don't know the name of God. They don't know the word of God. They've heard that Jesus is referred to as the word of God. But they think they can destroy him. His robe was dipped in the blood of the wicked, indicating their complete and utter destruction. So now so many people say that people, every, all human beings have eternal life. I've heard sermon after sermon after sermon. The question is, is are you going to spend it in hell, fire for eternity, or with Jesus Christ for eternity? The word is clear. If your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, you will be utterly destroyed, annihilated, never to exist again. However, if your names were written in the book of life and you refuse God, you refuse to follow God, but chose to follow the devil, you will be cast into the lake of fire with the devil. Two groups of people. Those who got the invitation and those who did not. I'm speaking of the parable of the wedding. Yes, you were going to say something. No, we had a, remember we had a brief talk on Friday. I asked you about this man, Williams, who went to uh, prison because he had killed someone. Correct. So Speak my, up, though, please. Yeah. So then my question was, the individual that he killed, was his name, was his name in the book of life or no? Well, we'll readdress that right here so our, our audience can hear, understand. I answered that question to you. I don't know because you didn't tell me you don't know all that. Uh, the apostles were killed, right? Their names were written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But you, you can't be killed until you finish the race. So maybe this guy's name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Maybe he had refused God to the point of no return. 
and now he dies. Maybe he name was written in the book of life and he was a great missionary and led many people to Christ. We don't know about this. But there's also the other possibility that he was just a human being created for destruction, as we find in Romans chapter 9, verse 22 and 30, 23. What if God wanted uh, created vessels of unrighteousness for destruction, annihilation, that he could show his mercy on vessels of righteousness? created for glory. Paraphrasing terribly. It but, would be the same thing <clears throat> as saying all the babies that are aborted, are their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life? Or aren't they? Some may, some may not. But if they are dead, they must not have been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Right, because they never had a chance to accept or deny. But they're great people. Were to have love and compassion for them, right? I mean, they could be terrible people, but I love my dog immensely. But he, Jesus did not die that my dog have eternal life. Okay? He's a great creation of God. God created on the sixth day, all the creation, mankind being uh, the, the, the end of it. And he said it's good. Not one of them needed salvation. Not a, one of them were appointed to salvation. Okay, does that answer your question even better? Hopefully so, it's because I, if you have that question, I know tons of people have this question. Now this reminds me of blood of us, reminds us of blood being used as a witness for one's character as seen in the use of the staining of the wed bride's Wedding dress, which testifies of her virginity. This is why the book of Revelation is out of, out of sequence. This is, this is out of sequence. But we got to show that the bride takes, the wedding takes proof because you have to have the witness of the blood stain. You have to have the witness of the blood, the proof for faithfulness. We, the bride of Christ, have to have the witness of Jesus' blood to prove our faithfulness. Now here, Jesus' blood-stained robe is a testimony of his faithfulness to his bride. He's not going to kill them because they didn't keep the Ten Commandments. He's going to kill them because they of uh, uh, shed the blood of his saints, of the bride. As we read earlier in Revelation, how long, O Lord, until you avenge the blood of the saints? Okay? So Jesus is going to come against those who came against his bride. Nevertheless, it was his own blood that was shed during his crucifixion not during this battle, during his crucifixion for the cleansing of his bride. Let's look in Revelation 12, verses 10 and 11. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Come, now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. And they overcame him, they, the accused, overcame him, the devil, by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. So when you testify in court, your testimony has to be proven credible, right? A lot of lawyers will try to prove that you're not a credible witness so that they would not listen to their testimony. But the blood of Jesus on them proves, proves their testimony is true. And what? That they, and they love not their lives unto death. The blood of Jesus proves we didn't love our life unto death. We're willing to die for Christ. We're willing to die then 
denounce Christ. You know, the apostles, it's been said by uh, 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 non-biblical accounts that the Romans and the Jewish, especially the Jewish people, uh, the, the Judaizers, the Sadducees, Pharisees, those who are in control, wouldn't kill you if you denounced Jesus. But they never would. They never did. That's why we know it's not a lie. Now verse 14 and 15. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he should rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. That's a mouthful. The armies of God are are uh, oh wait there right. yeah right here. The armies of God are called chosen, and his bride is seen in. We'll go to Revelation 17, 14 in a bit. However, this army of believers may be doing nothing more than observing this battle as Jesus smites the enemies with the sword of his mouth and shall rule over them with a rod of iron. This ruling with a rod of iron speaks of total and complete annihilation of them in the great wine press of God's wrath. There we go. So, Revelation chapter 17, verse 14 shows us, And these shall make war with the Lamb, and shall overcome them. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and kings of kings, and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Are you the chosen? Many are called, few are ch chosen. Are you faithful? He's So Christian, his bride, is going to be with them as Jesus overcomes the devil and these armies. The armies. Okay? It doesn't say we do anything. Jesus overcomes him. But we're there with him. Now, do we do some? I don't know. The Bible doesn't say we do anything. That doesn't mean we don't. But it definitely says Jesus does. And he, he overcomes them with his, the sword. Now, Psalms chapter, Psalms chapter 2, verse 8 and 9 says... Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thy inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. This rod of iron is not to sit there and be a harsh ruler. It's a harsh judge. You're going to destroy them utterly, completely. Now, if you die by getting beat with a, a, a hickory stick or a two-by-four, right? Baseball bat. Is that any worse than dying with a iron pipe? If you hit somebody in the head with a baseball bat and they die, is that going to be any different than hitting them in the head with an iron pipe and they die? No, they're both dead. But what's the point? The iron pipe takes one blow. The baseball bat might take multiple blows. So God's going to rule them with a, a rod of iron, meaning it's going to be speedy. It's going to be complete. There's no second chances. There's no additional thoughts. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24 tells us, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when he shall have put all down, all rule and all authority and all power. Jesus puts down all rule, all authority and all power. 
So there's going to be no power left, no authority left, nothing but Jesus. Why? Because our enemy is defeated by the word of God. Am I boring you? No. Okay. Now, Revelation 19, verse 16 says, And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So he has on his vesture, his rope. It, 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 it. It's not a shield. It's not a breastplate. But it's a, a scarf you wear kind of over it that you might have. We've seen this in knights in medieval days. They'll have the king's crest on them. Uh, the crusaders, they used to have that cross right there, right? Remember that? And it was cloth, and it was over their armor, right? And when you rode a horse, you had that banner, you had that cloth on your left thigh. So that when you were on a horse striking other people down, they seen who it was that was uh, killing them, taking them. They found out who it was that was uh, fighting the battle. Because how many times do you know that you go to battle with not just one country? You have a alliance, people in alliance. So you could hire another country or another group of people to come battle with you and they're all wearing different they're all wearing different banners they might be hired by the king of england to fight against such and such but they are all different banners okay so we have the banner of uh, christ has the banner saying he's the lord of lords and king of kings aren't you glad you serve the lord of lords there ain't nobody under him. Seems like it sometimes. Seems like Satan's more powerful than God sometimes. Doesn't it? Let's be honest. We know he's not. We try not to say it, but we live in this world. Who, and who's the king of this world? Satan. Satan. Who said that? Jesus. Is it true? Yes. Why? Because Jesus says, how come none of us want to admit that Satan's in control? Oh, so many people, oh, God's in control. No, Satan's in control. God's battling with you. God takes what Satan has designed for evil and turns around for good. Satan's always out to kill, steal, and destroy. God's out to fight against you in these spiritual realms to take those fiery darts that the devil is shooting against you and turning them around for good, quenching them with faith. We have the shield of faith that quenches all the fiery darts of the devil. Dude, we are being attacked all the time because Satan is the ruler of this world. But we have a mighty king. We have a mighty God. We have a mighty warrior, the man of war, who's going to help us <laughs> defeat the devil. Because you can't defeat the devil now. You don't have this new body. You don't have a body like Jesus that could walk through walls. We will, but we don't right now. You have a body that's subject to cancer. You have a body that's subject to aches and pain. You have a body that if I took a baseball bat and hit you in the arm, it would hurt your arm and probably disable you where you couldn't fight against me. Jesus does. You see the difference? So, wow, I read verse 16, right? Isn't that what I just read? Getting off on my side. Yeah. Remember, during Jesus' time on earth, we see him confronting some demons who know who he is and what he has been appointed to do, but also knows it is not <coughs> their time for torment. So how would you like to be somebody in prison that knows they got death row and knows that they're their time for appointing, they're going through an appeals court. They're waiting for the governor to write a reprieve. 
and someone comes and grabs him and hauls him down the road, the hallway quickly to kill him. And he goes, wait, wait, it's not my time. I have an appeal. I'm waiting for the call from the governor. Matthew 28, verse 29. And behold, they cried out, they, the demons, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, Son of God? Woo! Right here, the Word of God says Jesus is the Son of God. Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? Hmm. You know, it's funny. I, I, I looked this up, but I didn't put the hyperlink right there. But, you know, that torment is annihilation, destruction. It's not causing them pain and suffering. It's not putting them on a, a stretch rack. Therefore, the name King of Kings and Lord of Lord is not to make known who he is, as the wicked already know Jesus is God. Rather, it is a proclamation of what he has done. So when Jesus is battling the people on the, uh, of the earth that are being influenced by demons, that are getting supernatural ability from demons to do supernatural events, they see that it's Jesus, the King of King and Lord of Lord. And they know supernaturally, these demons know that they cannot fight against them and win. And they die. And they die very quickly. Verse 17 and verse 18 says it like this. Of chapter 19, right? And I saw an angel standing in the sun. And he cried with a loud voice saying, All the fowls of the air, all the fowls that fly in the midst of, the air, of heaven, come hither, gather... Let me wait. Okay, starting over, verse 17 says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come hither and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God, that ye may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sit on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. I want to bring this point. It's all men. How many is all? All. So is there any that are going to be left? If everyone, if the birds are going to eat on the flesh of all the uh, of all the men, are there any men that are going to be left? Keep that in mind. These birds being gathered are likely to be vultures or some other type of scavenger birds, used to clean up the carnage of people of the earth. Notice there is no one left to bury the dead as the church has already been raptured and the marriage of and the marriage of Christ with his bride has already taken place resulting in there being no one left to mourn and bury the mighty men there are captains and the kings of the earth but only the devouring of their flesh by scavengers now, this is important that we recognize this because other people are going to teach you about the, the Battle of Armageddon. That it's going to take, I forget, like six months to bury the dead. And they're going to go and make little markers of it. There's going to be so many people. No, this is after that. This is the end of the end. This is when all... All mankind is done away with and perished. This is like the flood of Noah. You know what happened at the flood of Noah? All mankind and the beasts of the earth were gone, destroyed, completely gone. But who? But Noah and his family. The only ones at this point in time are the bride of Christ. 
left. Okay, so this brings us to our conclusion. Jesus is a man of war to avenge the blood of saints, which was shed in the service of their God and King. How many times are we tempted just to say, oh, I don't follow God because I'm going to lose my job? How are, do you have enough wavels to say, oh, I'm not, I'm, a, I'm a not denounce God because you're going to be skinned alive? You're going to be beheaded? We see that as happening today, and we know it's been happening for decades, as, as centuries, in other countries of the world. But as this onslaught of evil comes onto our shores, and we, as this nation, America, are allowing them, they're going to kill you. They're going to shed your blood. But we're to pray for him. Why are we to pray for him? Two reasons. One is their names might be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and they come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do the will, his will. Or the other is you're putting coals of fire on them. You know, they kill your kid, you want to do you want to kill them? But you say the death penalty is not enough? The gas chamber is not enough? You want to pull each toenail out one at a time? Flay his skin? You want to cause their torment so long, so terrible, to justify the killing of your innocent little baby? Jesus says, pray for your enemies. This brings us to the conclusion of God's character. He is not good all the time to his creation. God, how many times do we hear that? I, you hear me say it all the time. God is good all the time to his inheritance. Jesus is not good all the time to his creation. He is utterly going to kill him and destroy him. He created him. Satan did not create these people that Jesus kills. Jesus created them and Jesus is going to kill them. So rather, it should be understood he is good all the time to his inheritance. You must understand if you are in God, God is good to you. He did not give you that sickness. He did not give you that disease. He did not whip you, take you into the woodshed and beat you with the stick to make you a better person. There's nothing you could learn on earth right now that is going to make your life better as the bride of Christ. Otherwise, think about it. Those who die on their deathbed, those who die, like my brother died the day before. I, I mean, he ex the day after he accepted Christ. Does he not get to have something in heaven because he didn't learn how to be a good Christian? How about the thief on the cross dies right there with Jesus? No, has, you cannot learn anything on earth to help you. God is not going to whip you, take you in the woodshed so you're a better Christian. That word is, uh, that doctrine is of the devil, and the Bible does not say that. Satan does it to try to get you to lose heart, to try to get, get you to go give up, to try to keep you from following God, to keep unforgiveness in your heart, to hold a grudge instead of forgiving and, and, and blessing. You hold bitterness and resentment in your heart, not to lose your salvation, but to cause havoc for others around, that they not be saved. So rather, it is, should be that he is good all the time to his inheritance, to delivering them from their enemies and setting them free of all unrighteousness. Therefore, believe with all your heart, those who Christ has freed are freed indeed. How many people say, oh, I just want to be free of drug and alcohol? I know people I love that battle this. That just got a hole. You got to believe what the Word of God says, not what the devil says. The Word of God says, John chapter 8, verse 38. 
if the Son of God shall therefore, uh, I mean, if the Son of God therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. If God has set you free, you're free. You got to tell the devil he's a liar. And you say, I'm, I'm not a drug addict. These feelings I have, they're lies. They've been overcome by the blood of Jesus. I plead the blood on this. I'm holy and righteous in the name of Jesus. As you're doing it. Let me give an illustration. As you're shooting up, saying the love of Jesus has set me free. The blood of Jesus cleanses me of all unrighteousness. As you're watching pornography, as you're doing all these other things, praise God says, I'm holy and righteous in God's sight. And you watch how that freedom, that, that proclamation of the freedom of Christ releases you from the power of Satan to do that. And you find yourself no longer wanting to do drugs. You find yourself no longer wanting to watch those movies. Even though they might be the only good movies out there, you get disgusted and turn it off and walk away. Finally, you have enough. Enough is enough. Therefore, believe with all your heart that God has set you free. Believe that if you ask anything according to his will, he will hear you. And if he hears you, he will grant your petition. Do you think it's God's will that you don't be addicted to drugs? Can I hear an amen? The word of God says this, and if this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, did we say most things? It says anything according to the will, he hears us. And we know if he hears us, whatsoever we ask him, we know that we have the petition that we desire. It's not that God hears us and ignores us. It's not that God hears us and says, no, not this time. you got something to learn. If God hears you, he will respond. And if you are a child of God, God hears you. And he does respond instantaneously. Well, why do I still have the battle? Because Satan's a liar and a deceiver. And he's trying to tell you you're still behind enemy lines. He's trying to tell you, oh, you haven't been free. Yeah, Jesus did his part, but you got to do yours. You're never going to be free. Is it Jesus' will for you to be free? Yes. Is it Jesus' will for you to be healed? Yes. Is it Jesus' will for you to live forever in your carnal body? No. So, you can ask and expect to be healed and freed from any sickness caused by demons. But you cannot expect to be healed from your natural aging process. In hopes of your youth being re regenerated while living in this carnal body. In other words, if that was just the case that God wants you to live forever on earth and you could be healed of everything, you would never die. You just get, keep getting older and older. We got one pastor who says he's going to live to be 120. He misinterprets scripture, but bless him. As long as he's going to live to be a ripe age, but he is going to die of old age. Now, hopefully he doesn't die of cancer. Because cancer doesn't come from old age. It comes from the devil. But he might die of heart failure. He might die of uh, cardiovascular issues. He might die of kidney failure. He might die of other organs just shutting down. He might forget and turn left when he sh uh, or go through the a red light, thinking that it turned green and get killed. You know, these are all part of the aging process. So we got to understand when we pray, we're praying against. The sickness and disease Satan has caused. Did Satan cause you to do drugs? Yes. Did Satan cause you to have unforgiveness? Yes. Did Satan cause you to believe a lie? Yes. Did Satan cause you to do good? 
No. Does Satan cause you to forgive? No. Does Satan cause you to give money away into ministry? No. All these things, you got these things that God causes and Satan causes. You got to keep that at bat. God is good all the time to his inheritance. Acts 10.38 says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with them. What did Jesus do? Healing all who were oppressed of the devil. He did not say God went about healing all who were oppressed by Roman tyranny. He didn't say God went all uh, healing all those that were born of birth defects. He didn't say God went all and healed those that were uh, killed and martyred by the Romans. He went about healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Genesis 3.19 says, In the sweat of thy thighs shalt thou eat bread, till thou return to the ground, for out of it thou wast taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. If you were able to pray your way out of that and live forever in this carnal body, God would be a liar. Nevertheless, God does do miracles. And it is his desire for us to live with a fully functional carnal body so that we might be ambassadors for him and that we might deliver those held captive by the devil with sickness, uh, by the devil with sickness and oppression. So God does do miracles. Miracles are not healing. Miracles are miracles. So, so let's say the devil didn't cause you to get in an accident. And you got in this car accident. And now you can't think straight. Now you fall down. Now you're having all these other issues. God can do it. That's not the demon. You didn't. This didn't happen because Satan is in your body. But God can give you a new heart. He could give you new bloodstream. He could give you the contusion, the brain injury, whatever. He can make it new. You're still going to die from of old age, from dust that you come, dust you go. But now you could be fully functional. I have never seen anybody ever test or heard anyone ever testify. I came to God because this totally incompetent, stupid person with Alzheimer's came and talked to me about Jesus. Have you ever heard anyone do it? You come to Christ because somebody fully functional and of a clear mind has convinced you that Jesus is Lord. If it was a raving of a lunatic, you would just pile it off. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. It is okay and expected of you to ask and believe in a miracle of healing that was not caused by demon oppression, but by the world full of genetic degeneration or that of a simple accident. In the story, amen. We got so many people in our life that are sick and they're saying, oh, by Jesus, by Jesus stripes, I'm healed. And they don't get anything. Because Jesus' stripes didn't weren't paid for your miracle. They were prayed for the oppression of the devil. They were prayed for sickness and diseases that came from the devil. But does Jesus, is he good all the time to his inheritance? Yes. Will he do a miracle for you? Yes. So if you are... are now with diabetes, if you are now with high blood pressure, if you are now with any physical ailment at all, you do not need to be healed. You need a miracle. Unless, of course, it's caused by the devil because you're doing things that you're not admitting. Unless, of course, you're letting the devil in and you're taking uh, uh, antidepressant drugs. 
because of some other drugs that you took 10 years ago that is causing your brain. It was all part of the devil. It just takes 10 years for it to develop. This is why God has given us, pastors, teachers, the gift of the discerning of the Spirit. you got to know how to pray. And when you pray for people who will be healed in the name of Jesus by his stripes and they don't get healed, people look around and say, well, see, God's false. you got to know. Well, it's just a natural aging process. Hope this is a... You find this uh, uh, free, that God wants you hail. God wants you well. If you're old, God wants you to be the happiest old person there is. If you're young, God wants you to be the happiest young person there is. If you got aches and pains and it hurts for you to walk, God wants you to walk, wants you to be able to walk without pain. He wants you healed, whether by a miracle or by his stripes. And that is God being good all the time to his inheritance. I will not be sick. And they, I go to the doctor and they try to tell me every single time I go to the doctor, they tell me I have high blood pressure. They tell me I got high cholesterol. I tell them they're wrong. They retest the blood pressure, blood pressure goes down. They redo a blood count. This last one, I didn't do a blood. And my blood, my, my cholesterol's fine. I just went to a physical. I have to for my insurance. They said, oh, you got high blood pressure. Oh, you got all this from the other. And you're looking at my chart. And I go, how do you know? You, you haven't done a blood test on me. It says, well, it says that 10 years ago or 15 years ago because when I was there before. I go, well, I'm completely different. Don't be pronouncing anything on my life. Take my blood pressure again. I took my blood pressure. Oh, all your blood pressure is good. We must have had the wrong cup size. I'm serious. They're going to try to tell you you need this drug. To do the work of Satan. Well, I need this drug. No, you need this drug because you're under the power of Satan. God wants you healed. Well, if I stop taking the drugs, I'm going to die. Yeah, I know. That's that catch-22. That's why it's a battle. That's why we say, don't stop taking the drugs until you're healed. But let's start believing and being healing. Let's start believing you need Christ. Not to drugs. Amen. I got to go. Hope to see everyone next week as we finish up chapter 19. Be blessed.